Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Soy Agustín Pérez Rubio y soy el coordinador y organizador de estas jornadas con, con Arteba del Prime Time. Y a estas alternativas de futuro, aproximaciones a diversas formas de pensar y actuar en lo contemporáneo, hemos estado, este es el tercer día, el primer día haciendo un repaso. Hicimos un repaso filosófico, sobre todo de las últimas casi 15 décadas, sobre la filosofía que se había escrito sobre el futuro, tanto a favor en contra, en una de las ponencias de Octavio Zaya. También vimos eh, de una manera muy local ese país que nunca, que era el país del futuro, algo como Brasil y que Solange Farkas magistralmente nos puso desde un punto de vista político, social y también artístico la realidad de esos futuros que se hacen presente y esas aspiraciones utópicas que llegan a a un camino sin salida. Y también, en cambio, nuevas alternativas y en esa idea de la acción, no solamente del pensamiento, George Judice estuvo hablando perfectamente de esa idea de una alternativa a partir de concepciones de lo procomún, es decir, nuevas formas colaborativas de aproximarse, sobre todo más que en el arte, sino a la nueva institucionalidad, de qué manera podemos crear un tejido ciudadano, un tejido también artístico y un tejido institucional a partir de nociones del procomún. Ayer, en cambio, hablamos de ciudad, de espacio, de territorio, de arquitectura y de urbanismo de la mano de uno de los más importantes arquitectos de las últimas décadas, eh, decano de la Facultad de Princeton, Alejandro Zaerapolo, que junto, hay mucho follón ahí detrás, no sé qué pasa, podéis decir que se calmen un poco, eh, que junto a Ciro Nadge y a Florencia Rodríguez estuvimos hablando justamente de cuáles son esas alternativas. Una de ellas, y que tiene que ver y que luego se va a tocar acá, tiene que ver un poco con lo que Octavio Zaya decía respecto a la filosofía de Fraser eh, sobre de qué manera el futuro va a estar completamente influenciado en cada uno de nuestros registros, en cada una de nuestras acciones, sobre todo a partir de dos puntos fundamentales. Uno de ellos es la, las catástrofes naturales, es decir, el climate change, las relaciones con la ecología, con el paisaje, con el aire, con de qué manera vamos a estar viviendo en otro tipo de situaciones. Y eso es, en cierta manera, eh, de lo que estaba hablando a partir de los cuatro elementos, agua, viento, tierra y fuego, varias de las propuestas arquitectónicas y urbanísticas de Zaera Polo respecto a cómo entender la arquitectura o la microarquitectura dentro de una cosmología política y en este sentido de una micropolítica. Él decía que nuestros cambios o el cambio del arquitecto, del urbanista, del artista, en ese sentido no va a ser eh, unos grandes giros, unos grandes gestos, sino que al contrario, en algo tan sencillo como el cambio de una ventana que se pueda abrir para tener aire, que tenga una ventilación, la nueva manera en la que una cubierta se va a recubrir de vegetal, en, eh, en la medida en la que vamos a retomar, sin ser totalmente retrógrados, en la manera en la que entender una arquitectura que no sea solamente como un neohipismo, ¿no? pero entender gran parte de ese condicionamiento ecológico, vamos a tener esos pequeños cambios y esas pequeñas alternativas alternativas de educación, eh, perdona, de, de eh, mirar el futuro de una manera más preservada. Otro de los, de los grandes cambios que decía Fraser, o de los temas importantes, tiene que ver, quizás se va a tocar tangencialmente hoy, y el porqué de esta mesa, que tenía que ver con la mecánica del automatismo, con la tecnología, con la robótica, es decir, de qué manera la tecnología y en esa medida va a influenciar nuestra medida en el trabajo, pero también en nuestro tiempo libre. De una manera u otra, estos temas van a estar ahí, tanto el cambio climático, pero me parecía muy interesante y también la manera en la que en cada uno de los tres días eh, hemos utilizado una metodología diferente de actuación. Si bien el primer día eran tres presentaciones individuales, y ya lo dije el primer día, cada una de las mesas se había trabajado con un invitado especial, el primer día con Octavio Zaya, a la hora de invitar a Solange y a George Judice, ayer... Con, uh, y en cambio era una presentación individual de cada uno con una conversación final. Ayer con Zaera Polo, con el que trabajé para invitar también a que las otras dos personas actuaran, pero en cambio era una, lo que se suele decir más, un keynote speaker, como una conferencia más importante y luego a la que nos sumábamos comentarios de Q&A, de preguntas y respuestas, tanto de Florencia y de Ciro y Mías. Y en cambio... 
la mesa de hoy tiene otra dinámica y otra metodología completamente diferente. Para la mesa, justamente hablar del futuro y de la tecnología y de esas pequeñas particularidades, sobre todo alrededor de ese otro espacio, invité, como no, a una artista con la que he trabajado, con la que me encanta su obra, es amiga y una de las profesionales en el campo tanto del arte, que es la artista Julieta Aranda, editora, artista conceptual, mexicana, que reside en Berlín, pero sobre todo invité a, a Julieta porque gran parte de su trabajo se ha relacionado no solo con lo tecnológico, si conocen sus últimas obras, sino con cuestiones que tienen que ver siempre con esa idea de un otro espacio exterior y esa preocupación que ella misma nos contará sobre las condiciones, cómo va a condicionar esa idea de futuro, tanto utópico como real, y ella tenía siempre la la, eh, dentro de su proyecto, la idea de realizar un, un proyecto teórico y unos seminarios respecto a esa idea de futuro. A partir de ahí y de la invitación a Julieta fue que tanto Sascha, po, no sé si lo pronuncio bien, Potef, Pofle, Sascha Pofle, es artista eh, alemán que reside entre Berlín y San Diego, da clases en el Visual Arts Department de la Universidad de San Diego, que si bien recuerdan es una de esas universidades especialmente interesantes en Art and Technologies. Yo siempre cuento esta cosa que todos hemos visto el famoso vídeo de Michael Jackson, del Morphine, del Black and White. Esa herramienta tan arcaica ahora para nosotros salió de un departamento como el, el departamento de San Diego University de Visual Arts. Y, y otros tantos proyectos, aparte que muchos arquitectos interesantes como Kion Park, Teddy Cruz y otra gente importante sale también como Sasha de ese contexto. Y luego tenemos a otro artista latinoamericano, también como Julieta, de origen mexicano, pero que ha vivido gran parte de su trayectoria en Londres y ahora en Berlín. Un artista que él se denomina espacial, compositor, instrumentalista y nos va a contar su relación, sobre todo con proyectos también con la NASA, etcétera, etcétera, y con ese espacio. De todos modos, como bien dije, la, um, la, la metodología de la mesa cambia completamente. Es decir, en primer lugar, y avisarles que la mesa va a ser completamente en inglés, porque si no era más cómodo entre ellos poder conversar, aquellas personas que no la vayan a entender, eh, aunque van a hablar de uno en uno, van a ser ordenados, eso espero, <risa> eh, pero tienen, si no, traducción simultánea allí fuera. Y lo que va a ocurrir después de hablar yo es que Julieta va, bueno, cada uno de ellos se va a presentar, porque también es interesante entender de dónde y el por qué se van a aproximar desde diferentes prácticas uh, artísticas, pero se van a aproximar a esta idea del de espacio, de las relaciones con el futuro. Y a partir de ahí, Julieta hará una pequeña introducción para ponernos en relación de los intereses Hemos oído independientes, pero el por qué y asumir una conversación coral. En ese sentido, la conversación coral va a tener esta metodología y va a ser a partir de seis preguntas, es decir, de six sub subjects, tópicos, tópicos, como de arte y tecnología, sobre el espacio, sobre el horror vacui, sobre la idea del lenguaje, sobre la idea del cambio climático y cuestiones que van a ir apareciendo. Entonces, a partir, cada uno de los tópicos durará alrededor de 10, 12 minutos, eso espero. Ellos van a conversar y abriremos a preguntas, una o dos preguntas, al público o a mí, para que les preguntemos a partir de ese tópico. Después de eso, otra vez, el siguiente tópico aparecerá, hablarán, pondrán imágenes, preguntas y así las seis veces hasta la hora y media. Tranquilos porque tenemos pensado acabar en una hora y media con las preguntas y todo y recuerden que hasta las nueve de la noche van a tener tiempo de abrir, la feria está abierta, de ver lo que les falta de la feria y bueno, yo creo que nada más. Sí que os voy a controlar bien el, el tiempo, también apuntar aquellas preguntas y controlar también a la gente que quiera eh, eh, hacer más que controlar, ver quién está interesado en hacer una pregunta o si no, ir sumando y también al final si ha quedado algo también poder, eh, poder eh, resumir. De todos modos, estoy muy contento de teneros. La verdad, Julieta, un placer de nuevo trabajar contigo y como no, Sasha y Naum, espero continuar eh, que esto solo sea el comienzo de posibles cosas futuras. Muchísimas gracias y paso la palabra a cada uno para la presentación.
A ver, bueno, pues en, en, en orden de manecillas de reloj. Um, ok. Uh, ya, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Uh, bueno, pero primero me disculpo porque, porque tendría que hablar en español. Es rarísimo hacerlo en inglés, pero es para que fluya la conversación. Entonces, so, hi, I'm Julia Taranda. I am an artist, an editor, and uh, I guess critical thinker, one could say. I uh, uh, run an organization called EFLUX, which is not pertinent to this. I just mention it because it's mentioned there. Um, I think one of the reasons why uh, we are doing this is because of the, like how much my, my work has been focused on notions that have to do with uh, both future, futurology, um, uh, trying to negotiate ideas about the space race and um, like space escape and uh, ideas of escapism and how does that relate to planetary projections and so on. I will expand on this. I don't give you too much about myself just yet. It comes. Um, uh, I guess I could say I'm a sculptor. That does, it doesn't matter, but it, uh, it, it locates me somewhere. Then, I pass the baton to Naum. Yeah, uh, hello, uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, Augustine, uh, Julieta for inviting us for, uh, to, this, to this panel. Uh, I'm an artist and from, from this position, I, I, I explore a couple of things uh, related to outer space. One is how, uh, how as an artist, I can, I can, I would say this wor word, hack. Uh, space organizations and and big international uh, institutions that work in our space uh, uh, technology. So we're talking about rockets, we're talking about uh, national space agencies, uh, also military or organizations, uh, and how as a civilian I can use their technology to make poetical work. So um, that's one approach of my work. Uh, uh, secondly, um, in, in, in the same spirit, uh, I try to, to, to influence part of this world. And one example is uh, uh, I chair a department for arts and culture in outer space in the International Astronautical Federation, the big space organization on our planet. And that's an example of how artists, we can have a, a say in these uh, planetary and interplanetary matters. And thirdly, uh, I run um, an institute called Cosmica, which is, again, about space exploration and our culture and arts. So that's it. And Sasha? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Sasha Fofle. Is this on? Yeah. OK. And um, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, apologies, again, that I'm probably the main reason for the non-Spanish <laughs> situation. Um, so, I mean, in, in, in my work, is, so I consider myself an artist and a researcher and with a design background, essentially. So um, my origin is from the, um, the Royal College of Art in London, which kind of started this speculative design, critical design work that you might have come across. Um, and I kind of like see my, my, my work in this kind of um, spirit in the sense that I, I like to use the means of art and design to kind of like speculate about what, what might happen in a way. But actually in, in that process, now it's better, right? Um, now in that, in, in that process, it creates synthetic knowledge in a way. So it can to, to kind of like collaborate with people who might be practitioners from different fields who might actually be thinking about the same, the same things that, that have a certain pertinence on, on the future of humanity, basically. So currently I'm, for example, part of a um, thing called CARTA, the Center for Research and Training in Anthropogeny at UC San Diego, which is basically an inter interdisciplinary group of people who look at the origins or like what the human phenomenon basically is. So like they're looking really at like what makes us different from great apes and what makes like tools and technology like really key in, in what makes us human basically. So I see my, my role in kind of like being a bridge between these things. So. And yeah, we're going to look at some work, I guess, as well. Okay. Thank you. So um, now that we know who we are, um, <laughs> uh, um, I think the the main topic of this uh, mesa uh, panel, yes, um, is uh, uh, trying to investigate some notions about the future. Like, like the title of it is like waking up in the future, and I. But I think the. Um, that's like for poetic reasons more than anything, uh, because I, one of the main points and like the convergence of our work um, 
is our interest in, in notions that exceed the planetary, that like sort of jump out of planet Earth and try to go into an elsewhere. Um, so notion, like what happens with space, why are we looking up at the stars, and how do we deal with that as artists? Um, you know, there are like several approaches. It can be from, some, some things are very direct and very um, almost innocent. Some things are more, um, um, uh, perverse, complicated, taking two steps back, uh, what not. So I think I would like in, in our position, it's, it's kind of interesting to try to analyze this, uh, like, this relationship of art, space, technology, like what the role that culture plays in, in this. So um, as I was saying, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm like split between English and Spanish, so I'm not, I'm not being fantastic. Um, the, so we have six topics. Um, the, I think like the first one is uh, is kind of like trying to oh to crack open this knot and to say well what is the at the at the current moment what's happening what's the relationship between and we have of course a PowerPoint presentation yes that's us ah no oh, well okay so sorry. That was me, that was my work. That's uh, a, a very quick thing. That's like a work of mine uh, dealing with zero gravity. That's work of Sasha. Um, I'm sorry, we skipped this part. <laughs> and that's a uh, work of Naum. So. Okay, so now we are into our first topic, which is uh, trying to figure out what is the relationship of art, how, how can we intersect <coughs> with technology, what, what can we bring to it, what do we do? So, um, Sasha had a point uh, there about, um, I think, I'll give it to you first, and to, to you guys first, mm. and then take three minutes each, yeah, and sure. then I'll close it off, yeah? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in... What, what, I mean, I just can speak personally, but, but in a sense, like what got me interested in space travel is that it's this, this like ultimate attempt, attempt at transcendence, right? That, that I mean, in, in art, you find as well, it is like a means to kind of reach, to reach to something that's kind of like beyond the possible, which sounds, sounds really cheesy, but if you look at actually some practitioners like Jack Parsons, who we talked about recently, there's a bunch of individuals that, for example, I focused on in, in some works I did that kind of embody like this strange like desire to kind of like either develop a technology that really transcends this human condition or to do things like occultism right and so which jack parsons which is one of the founders of the jet propulsion laboratory in pasadena that are driving around the mars rover on mars you know in the, as a person kind of embodied so there was something for me in that is that really um kind of like embodies that and if you look at the history of space travel which is probably like a bridge to the the first kind of topic or the way we get in there. Um, you find that a lot, actually. So find, you find you down. Do you want to skip to the first? No, not yet. We mm. actually don't. Uh, this is we, here. But, uh, I, but I think the first image relates. No, but there is no image here. Oh, there's no image here. No. Oh, OK, OK. <laughs> you killed them all. Great. So if no, you look they at are, They are there, but they come yeah. uh, at the imaginary part. But <laughs> for example, if you look at Jules Verne, for example, right, the, the author, and then, and then how he inspired um, the initial of Science, right? The calculations that Tsiolkovsky was a Russian researcher who not only wrote sci-fi but also wrote the rocket equation that, that all space travel is um, based on. You find this like really interesting ecosystem where you have basically like, a feedback loop between people who are like predicting or for, like in imagining, envisioning the future, and then people who kind of make it real. Sometimes the same people, sometimes different people, and that's a really interesting space in a sense that is still quite active, right? And yeah. Um, you know, but more than talking about the imaginaries that we create, I mm -hmm. think just like to open it up, the idea would be to try to discuss why art looks at this without mm -hmm. this, like in a in a you know like two steps removed. Mm -hmm. Not what not what do we see, but why do we look at it? Mm -hmm. That's why the images are not here. <laughs> so I mean, like the, I don't know, like just to yeah. to make an example, I'm going to give you the dark. I, I skip and I give it back to you. Um, I, I'm going to give you the dark uh, version, like the, the pessimistic notion right now, which, um, I, as I see, I teach right now a seminar in a university in Basel about art and science. And 
What I notice is that more and more artists get interested in the STEM field of science and in the hard sciences as humanities kept being cut from the curriculum of universities. And at the same time that it fascinates me, it troubles me because it makes me think that one of the reasons why we are looking at science in art, and I do this all the time, I, it's, it's part of my work, is because we want to make an art that can be quantifiable and that can be produce results that we can measure. So mm. that troubles me immensely. Before discussing it, the, the, the images that we create, that, so if I do this, if I look at that, I want to look at it from the opposite direction and saying, I will not give you the quantifiable. I will not give you something that you can measure. I will not give you something that you can use. I, I will behave like an artist, not like a scientist. Um, so that's, that's what I am. Uh, also to tell you that maybe also it's really problematic in terms of if we talk about labor, you know, like if you quantify later, there is a political issue very hard about it, you know? Mm. You know, like I, I think we can get very enamored about replicating laboratory conditions, making experiments, things that can be replicated. And the real leaps in science happen when something exceeds, you know, when something mm. jumps, when Goes something wrong. breaks the mold. Um, mm. That's all, that's, at, at the end, as an artist, that's the moment that I am concerned with. Okay, passing it on. Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, it's uh, just linking what uh, Sasha and Julieta just said, is, um, of course, the, the, the relationship about, uh, well, in arts and science, collaborations can be very problematic, uh, especially because, because uh, if, if, we, if we attempt to, to erase the, the boundaries between arts and science, then we'll be speaking the same language. And, and as much as uh, some, uh, some people really praise how artists can potentially advance uh, scientific knowledge or innovation uh, through technology, I think um, we, are, we are making the artist to, uh, to prove things. And that's not necessarily our, our, our thing. Our thing is to, to, to present. And, and going back to what Sasha said, uh, I think before all that, there's something uh, extremely important. And that is the creation of imaginaries and the creation of poetics. That's how. Uh, uh, a lot of science started before there was such thing as science, and and that's what we uh, and well that's that, that that's, that's an important focus. So we can uh, turn the page and think of these radical perspectives instead of inserting ourselves into other shoes that already exist. Um, okay, so this would be more or less closing the first, uh, like the opening of the topics. If somebody has a question, this would be the moment. Para la gente que llegó más tarde, porque los veo que hay gente nueva, después de cada tópico, de que después que ellos estén hablando, como en la conversación, unos 10 12 minutos, vamos a abrir turno de preguntas una o dos, en el caso de que hayan, y continuar con el segundo tópico. Si no hay nada, si no hay nadie, seguimos. Yo creo que es... Seguimos. Mm -hmm. Ok. Ok, so the... The second topic, I guess, is uh, then now uh, then we try to figure out why it is that we are looking at space. And the kind of, uh, okay, well, the, I guess, I guess uh, the, the protocol is going to be that uh, Naum and Sasha speak and then I close it off, yeah? Yes. So, Okay, well then I'm happy to start. Um, the, well, well, why are we looking at, at outer space? Um, I, we, we were having this discussion earlier today and I like to use the, the, the example of what happened in the Apollo missions uh, when they said that they went to the moon to discover Earth. So I, normally I adopt an Earth-centric approach, uh, and that is our space uh, activities uh, are there, or we do them, for Earth, 
to understand ourselves, understand what's happening uh, in, 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 our, in our planet, in social ways, in ecological terms, in, in planetary systems. Um, so so how, we, how we use also those perspectives to reframe uh, our models of governance, of coexistence, um, and for me, that's, that's something important in space activities. Hmm. I mean, if you, when you talk about outer space, the question is always like, what's the outside, right? Hmm? Oh, sorry, yeah. um, what's, the, what's, yeah, yeah. what's the outside? And it's, it's almost like this is perfect negative, right? You go to this kind of like inverse condition to kind of like then look back or find something else, you know? And then the question is always like, what are we... Like what are we, what are we expecting to find, right? Like, are we if we're looking for alien life, then you know we are maybe actually looking for the definition of life, right? And we, if we don't find the defin definition of life, then we find maybe for us, we're looking for a space to fill it with like something new that relates to that. Um, but yeah, so that's the. <laughs> it's in there, it's in there. Is that the sound from the video? Yeah, yeah, we didn't know there was sound in the video. Um, but I mean, that's, that's, that's obviously one of the first movies, right? And, and the, the, the reason why we put it in was because that's kind of, that goes back to these, these imaginaries that like the, what, what inspired these kind of movies was eventually what, what I said earlier was what also inspired the technological um, development of these things. And this is actually, so these are the drawings by Tchaikovsky. Um, this Russian kind of like quite solitary Cosmist. genius, cosmist. I mean, very interesting person because he was invested in the cosmos philosophy in science fiction, but also in um, quite hardcore engineering. And then he did this beautiful thing that he would draw pictures of people in space. He would, he would kind of like visually almost like pre enact these conditions that his kind of invention would put people in, what, 70, 80 years later. And also that's the question, like, what, what was he looking for? Like, what, so he was responding to something, which was obviously the, the cosmos philosophy, which was quite like a certain nationalist kind of like Russian philosophy that he then kind of like, you know, responded to with his vision, but then also he filled it with these visuals. <laughs> um. Um, uh, I mean, like, well, I, when, I, when I think about the what it is to look at space and why are we looking out. There is, and it's a mistake not to have it here, but um, there is uh, an old illustration that's called the Flammarion, um, which is an image of someone trying to poke his head outside of the planet atmo atmosphere. And it makes me think, uh, it has always made me think that like the, this idea of escaping, of feeling um, confined to the planet, it's an innate condition of humanity, so of course we are um, also trying to get out, also trying to, un to, to understand where we are, why we are here, how can we go to this, like elsewhere. And, and then of course projecting um, what we know into the larger canvas that is out there. It works as a fantastic uh, space of projection. And I think that's what this, this kind of... Um, mm fantasy of escape either it can be pre galilean or not it can some you know some there are like some positions that center everything around the human that say okay well here you know here we are and then we will only be more human um, out there and this is only a projection um, there are um, other positions that are looking at post human conditions and are you know at um, other intelligence and intelligences and at like trying to understand life manifestations at larger um, uh, like speculative positions. So this is a, um, a kind of, uh, um, I mean, like the, the kind of like, the, what, what kind of canvas does a space become? What, it, and it really, it, at this point at least, it holds everything that we throw at it. So that's the, the, the kind of, um, um, I mean, like the, it's interesting because there, has, there have always been artists that are working with the, you know, from Mal Malevich and Jules Verne and Georges Méliès, and, but not, not to just stay with Cosmis and the classics. It's interesting to see um, what uh, 
more contemporary artists like from our day are doing. And so we just picked mm. two quick examples. One is um, Katia Novitskova, who is an Estonian artist. Um, she has been quite involved with the uh, Curiosity Mars rover. And then uh, one or two years ago, she made an exhibition where she actually replicated the um, <clears throat> the landscapes that the uh, Curiosity was sending to Earth and inserted animals and created a television studio so it was possible to insert yourself within these landscapes of pure desire. Um, so that's, I mean, like it's interesting to see how we take it now because it's very different from a painterly approach of, um, you know, um, Malevich or any of the classics, let's say. Sasha, you should talk about the other. Yeah, image. I mean, about what? About yeah. So, I mean, what's what's interesting, or like what this just made me think of, is that uh, it is almost interesting to imagine it as a three-dimensional space, right? So, this you can slide into the future. You can say like where this is going to be, and then you can kind of like reflect on what's going on now, which probably Katya is doing to some extent, in a very very interesting way that she uses these scientific images as like an inspiration, or like a you know like a, as a visual reference to kind of work with these. To work with the kind of like larger cultural framework of this, and she, I mean, obviously you have this like growth graph in there, so it's a very complex image that kind of like takes from scientific imagery, but also kind of like economic imagery, and it's quite funny as well. Um, but then, I mean, there's like this sidestepping action, and I think that's actually the rarest. And I couldn't actually think of something like that. So if you think about this idea of the the paradigm shift that the Thomas Kuhn, the science writer, brought up that sometimes happens in science, what you talked about earlier, that some, you read, that the, I mean, there's this idea that like, there's a revolution that cannot really be anticipated, right? And, and, and I would say that can probably not only come within the field, but it can also come from other fields, so that's like a thing for art. But so the Thomas Saraceno um, piece that we're looking at now is quite interesting because he makes these vast um, installations, right, that are like bubbly, Architectural installations, but in a in a sense, they, without really speaking to the space theme, they're totally speaking to the space theme because he arrives at a point that that, like astrobiologists, for example, are talking about when they speculate about life in space that like on on gas planets that have less gravity on uh, more or less density. I mean that like, you know, like a life form could be like a big bubble essentially. Or if you want to have a spaceship on, on Venus, it would be like some giant floating device. And without actually kind of like going into the science, even though he's quite involved in that, he actually arrives at this point that then science people can point at, you know? And that's, in, in my work personally, that's something that actually has happened to me, that, that I've speculated about something with a collaborator and then, and then science practitioners said like, well, this is actually what we're thinking about, you know? But we couldn't verbalize it in that way, you know? And I think, I think that's a really inter interesting thing that can, can sometimes happen serendipitously, that, that you know, you just do something that resonates with somebody, but you can also do it on purpose. And I think these are like the rare, interesting moments where these kind of like shortcuts happen. And, and I mean, he's quite a good example of somebody who's been doing that quite, um, yeah. Well. Uh, related to this image, just today, Alejandro Zaira was, we were talking about the Bubbles House and this recreation from the 60s and 70s of architecture. But he was talking about this biological environment that is going to happen in the future. So in one moment, uh, for him, it was more important uh, this idea of the surface in the architecture as a membrana, how do you say, like a membrane, you know, between the public and the private, and also as a, a, a space of Careiness, you know, to take care from the others, you know. So there is a very ambivalence um, idea in between this bubble architecture because if one hand is a very utopian, on the other hand is something that has their new roots related with the climate change, you know, in the future that he is going to. So it's in relation with some of the ideas that yesterday Alejandro also talked in his, mm. uh, in his talk. Can I, can I add to the membrane? So the membrane is actually, I think that's something really interesting. That's something that relates to what we talked about earlier, you know, that the ecosystem or the eco, the, the biosphere is essentially de defined by this almost arbitrary membrane that's in, or like, you know, space starts in 100 kilometers height because somebody has decided that. And, and the first thing to pierce that was basically a modified German rocket carrying a camera, which was the, the 
image that we briefly saw, or like the, the video that didn't play, right? The, it's basically the first image from space, right? Where this, they shot this camera up to look, see what it looks like. And this idea of like the membrane in the inside and the outside, because Saraceno's work also defines these insides and outsides, right? But it puts you on the outside, which is also kind of interesting. Yeah. But, you know, I think well, this is a little bit like the Flammarion, because the Flammarion totally, is totally, one yeah, of those yeah. things that creates that. It's like one of the first depictions of a membrane. But just to bring it back to, to art and to see what uh, Thomas Saraceno makes with the work, it's not, I don't think it's only an illustration of this kind of of like biological mm. forms and so on. Um, to me, what it does is that it takes um, these speculations away from um, the one-to-one -one reference to the human. Yeah, I don't recognize myself there. I find them. I, I don't see them as architecture either. I see them as life possibilities, as a space possibilities, and I'm very happy that they don't. They are not mirrors. They don't return mm. my image. And that's something that, of course, is not backed by science. It's simply something, it's, a, it's a speculation. And in, the, in that sense, I find it incredibly powerful. So, just to say. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. I think we for the second topic. So, for the second topic, we're done. So, uh, perdón, uh, si alguien tiene alguna pregunta o cuestión o comentario sobre el segundo topic. No? So we go further, so we go to the third topic. Okay. The, um, the, the third topic, it's also, it's, uh, it's uh, like when we are opening, like just like trying to fill layers, yeah? And the third topic has to do with, no, that's not, uh, it's, yeah, the, the kind of imaginaries that we are looking at, that we, that we can produce. And I think Saraceno is a very good, um, you know, because we, we are not going to be doing amateur research. Yeah, that's, uh, that's bad research and bad art at the same time. It's like a great combo. Um, but so if we are actually wanting to do something that's uh, powerful out of this, yeah, like what, what are the kind of images that we want to produce? And, and why? So before, I, I, I have a, um, a dark, like a little bit of a dark uh, uh, perspective there. So before I give, uh, I give my perspective, I'm passing this on to both Sasha and Ellen. Okay, so yeah, what kind of uh, imaginaries uh, happen when we're looking at, um, at our space? And, 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 and the, 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 again, another analogy, there's something called uh, the moon bounce. Moon bounce, like moon, moon and then bounce, like it bounces back. It's, it's an old uh, way of uh, sending uh, radio signals across the, the planet using the moon. So you beam a signal to the moon uh, somewhere in Holland and then it bounces back using the moon because it can be very reflective and then it arrives to, to Brazil. Uh, but, in it, but it's transformed by its journey through the atmosphere and then by touching the surface on the moon. So what they get on the other side is something uh, completely different from the first thing that you sent. That's why they don't use it anymore. It's extremely noisy. But in a, in a similar fashion, what is extremely interesting is how we can send some, some ideas or even some problems to outer space. Imagine also that our space can be a sort of black canvas, uh, maybe uh, a, a link to, to Malevich as well. Uh, and, 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 and in this place, whatever you send, it, uh, it either get lost or it could be transformed. So it's an opportunity to explore uh, this black canvas and, and, and actually rewrite or rethink or reframe uh, many of the things that we are doing here. So, for example, by, by, by thinking, what are some uh, uh, ownership issues on the moon or on Mars? Who owns certain territory? If, if Russia, USA, Europe, and China go to the moon and start exploiting it, who is going to benefit from that? Is it going to be the countries, their private companies, or is it shared between all nations? Is it a global common? We don't know. There's not an answer. Even though uh, the Space Treaty talks a little bit about ownership and exploitation, there are many uh, uh, black holes in, 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 in this international law. So many things are to be written. And, and by, by solving a problem, uh, 
in outer space, perhaps we are finding new models that could then, using the moon bounce analogy, that then we could reapply on our planet. So this is the importance of the creation of new imaginaries, uh, because we can be as, as, as radical as we want. Uh, there are no rules out, out there, and perhaps in the, in the future these ideas could, could uh, be implemented on, on our planet, and, that, and this is what, what the, 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 the interesting thing of artists working on, this, on these visions, uh, it's important. Uh, I mean, we, we're talking about Tomas Saraceno, and I, I see his work also as a, as a provocation of, a, of an imaginary. Uh, it, it could be of either catastrophe or climate change, uh, floodings on the planet and inhabiting the clouds. But also, uh, there's another example, and that is uh, the, uh, uh, Dr. Atl, which was a, a Mexican uh, painter and volcanologist, amazing. And before there was a uh, space race, he, or, or even like strong art science collaborations, he was thinking of, of building um, sort of a, 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 an utopia, but it was not an utopia for him. It was called Olinka which was a city for only artists and scientists. And in this city, there will be a section for exploring solar energy, another section for studying uh, feminism, and a third place for studying outer space. So maybe designing things to explore outer space, but by artists. Déjame solo un, que quizá el público no se acuerda de Dr. Atel, es este artista mexicano que toda su vida pintó solamente volcanes. Creo que ustedes la han visto en muchas exposiciones sobre vanguardia y modernidad en México. Es uno de los maestros más importantes y un artista que se salió de su práctica, incluso que hizo con Barragán, la famosa El Pedregal, a nivel urbanístico, que sigue la idea de la lava, etcétera. Es decir, la idea de la biología del outer space. Él estaba relacionado siempre con esa noción de la tierra. ¿no? Creo que es importante, porque igual la gente no lo identifica. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so these are the kind of imaginaries that, that after, after some time, it, it, they, they, they could bring some insights into, into the future, and that's what we're talking about this evening. Mm. So I, I like this idea that exporting problems into space, it's a, <laughs> it's a good idea. Um, I mean, the, the, the imaginary and space I mean, in a sense, makes me think of the history of the space, the space colonies that were proposed in the 1960s, and how that played out in kind of the American counterculture. It's very interesting. So that how Buckminster Fuller, the architect, gave a bunch of talks in in San Francisco and Berkeley, at UC Berkeley, and then made many people essentially move to the, like the countryside and build these domes, you know, and live in the domes and and that didn't work for multiple reasons. But then there was this really interesting moment in the early 70s when NASA was essentially kind of, so there was the NASA administrator at the time, um, Gerard O'Neill, was quite conscious of the fact that he, they could potentially they have this like 10-year window when they can piggyback this incredibly expensive thing to like get a colony in space onto the Cold War, basically. When they said like, well, if we tell them it's because of the Russians they might do it, right? So there was this, and there was, and we're going to see actually a drawing of somebody later who was involved in that. But what's interesting is that, I mean, it didn't happen, obviously, apart from space stations, which are kind of a child of that in a way. But um, in the early 70s, there was this discussion within the counterculture whether space might be the place to, like, have the real colony, right? It's really away from, like, the American system, you know, and it's far away from Vietnam and everything until they realized that like, that kind of stuff is based on top of the whole kind of like military, military industrial machinery, right? So to get one person into space, it needs 100,000 people working in this like, pyramid, basically. And there was, there was immediately dropped, basically, as <coughs> a vision. So and there's a really interesting thing so in this one issue of this magazine, Co-Evolution Co Quarterly, this was basically, basically discussed. And, and I think that's a really, really good example how this kind of like, you know, something gets kind of like projected into this void and then discussed, and then almost kind of like, you know, comes down again. So there's a lot of kind of these examples of that, and that like probably interesting like lessons in order, you know, like both what it means to us and both what, how maybe like like 
the new thing relates to that or doesn't relate to that, because obviously these things have become much cheaper with these, you know, microsatellites and these things that we're talking about. So it's actually possible to have like an alternative vision of that now that you couldn't in the 70s. <coughs> the, I mean, like the like now now is what I have like a dark perspective. Yeah. The, I mean, because of course I think that yes, it's it's yeah we export our problems into space and then it just becomes this. A replicator, yeah, where we, I mean, like, if we are, if what we are doing is exporting our problems into space, it means we have not been able to find any solutions. It, mean, it means we have not learned much. And it, in terms of, like, what it means to be human, it troubles me greatly, yeah. So one of the, um, <clears throat> what I keep thinking about, this, I, I was thinking a lot about this, yeah, like, um, if all, we are, if all we are doing is to export our problems into this elsewhere, um, we are not very far away from gentrifiers. Yeah? The, the, I, like, I was like, thinking a lot about that um, when I was invited to do uh, zero-gravity flights uh, by some European nice space agency that put me into like, doing like, 70 zero-gravity flights. Then at some point I was, and they expected me kindly without really saying to make a work, but they did, there was no exhibition attached to it, so they were just like, we hope you do something. And have you done something? And I was like, well, no, I haven't done anything. It was great, fun, but I haven't done anything yet. Thank you. And I couldn't do anything with it. I, you know, I took photos and I took some video and I just could not figure out how to make this into anything meaningful. Um, and I kept thinking about it, and what made me crack this was um, at some point, out of like just staring at this material and trying to figure out, okay, how do I make this like something that I keep being kindly nudged as like, have you made this something? And um, what I did was I added up the cost of putting me in zero gravity 70 times. And the amount of money was insane. It was a lot of money. And I kept thinking then, well, why somebody is spending that amount of money on putting me in zero gravity? Wait a second, they were not putting me. They were putting an artist. It was not, it was not Julieta, it was an artist. It was an artist's body. So, okay, then I got rid of myself. Okay, why somebody would spend that amount of money on putting an artist in this situation? And I still had no answer, yeah? And the answer came from this image. So, this is a um, uh, Sports Illustrated uh, magazine calendar um, where they, the NASA sent this model, uh, Kate Upton is her name, into to zero gravity to shoot, to, to make this fashion shoot. There she is next to a proper ast like, uh, astronaut. Yeah? And, yes, yes, of course. No, 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 this, this absolutely happened. And this image, funny enough, is what made me understand exactly um, what was the something I was supposed to do and what was the role that I was expected to play. Um, because, of course, the reason uh, for spending this amount of money on putting an artist's body in this situation is, uh, in, in, a, in a dark way, it's a gentrifying process. I am expected to create desires that people can identify with. I am expected to produce this wonderful vision of the world and reality and this image. I mean, like, the American version, the US version, is a little bit more crude, and they just show you tits, and it's like, hey, tits in space, tits in space, is great. Um, but it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's not, essentially, like, the aim is not different. So it's up to me, then, as an artist, to subvert that and to make it different. And I mean, like from that, from that uh, epiphany that this woman uh, made me have, um, a lot of the of, of my thinking about okay, so how do we subvert? How do we change the projection? How we just not how we just not act as gentrifiers of this uh, new frontier? Uh, but you know, yeah. Mm. And that be the third topic. Um, we take questions now. ¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta o comentario al respecto del tercer tópico y después de estas imágenes un tanto <ríe> sexy y un poco <ríe> machistas y, y muchas otras cosas más? <ríe> ¿No? Pasamos al cuarto.
tópico. Ok. Se empieza a poner divertido. Um, mm -hmm. um, I think this is a, a, a bit of a trying to understand what's our relationship to the to outer space. Is it because um, uh, we are splitting this in two points? One is like maybe it is because we are just like simply afraid of being alone, and we are looking for interlocutors, for other life forms, for somebody to talk to us. Um, that's one possibility. The other possibility is that um, we actually are uh, as bad as we have always been and we want to continue colonizing practices. So uh, that we are as bad as we have always been and want to continue colonizing. So that's the, those are the two possibilities we have. I'm passing the table to my colleagues. Yeah, I mean, we found these nice images of Mars. <laughs> so basically, I mean, you know, looking at Mars, it's essentially a desert, you know, it's like the most unhospitable place that you can imagine. And this is Horovaki, if you go back, yeah, so and this, that's the sunset on Mars, right? And you see this one pixel, I don't even see it, but this one pixel is Earth. So it's, you know, it's like the loneliest space you can imagine. And and the question is like, you know, if, if you're looking for something there, like what are you looking for? You know, or if you want to put something there, what do you put there? You know, that's kind of, in a sense, goes back to this definition of life. And I mean, and obviously art is also concerned with, with many of these questions. And, and, you know, the question like, if, is life, you know, do we actually need a new definition of life to actually have life in space? And the, are we actually looking of a different definition of life? Um, but this horror, I mean, the horror vacui thing, you know, can can we bear? You know, can can we bear ourselves? <laughs> maybe I don't know. You know, does does that relate to? Does, hmm? Oh, sorry, the fingers not gonna. Does that, of course, uh, does does you know like? Because I mean, the creation. So I'm I'm also quite interested in synthetic biology. So this kind of quest to like like modify existing life forms or make new life forms, and I was recently talking to a good friend who's a historian of biology, and he basically, his, his current research is that astrobiology as the search for life has this amazing overlap with the creation of life, you know, and creation of life as in the design or the dreaming up of new life forms, a la Frankenstein, basically. So this like old narrative of the arts, essentially, you know, what, what does it mean to make life? And, and and he basically says like looking for life in space is almost like the same effort. It might just you know maybe they're both hopeless. You know maybe this, they come out of like a certain desire, but the desire is almost like a reflective one. Um, so yeah, you can maybe talk about what city, which would be interesting. Yeah. So um, I mean, I mean what, uh, it's, it's strangely enough, uh, a big driver for uh, for current space exploration is the the search of life. We really want to put ourselves or uh, the image of something like us or the life that we know somewhere else in 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 outer space. And as we, as we as we evolve as a species, we and, and we transform ourselves. We try to adapt this image into the thing that we want to find out there. For example, uh, SETI, which is uh, a series of centers that search uh, extraterrestrial life, pretty much uh, an idea started by Carl Sagan. Um, they, today they're talking about not finding, in, in the beginning they were like looking for life as, as we know it, like organic life, but today they're searching for robotic life. So the, it's our prediction of, 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 of life forms, even in, in our planet, and, and, and the reason why this makes sense to them is because they started to, to study the, the, the evolution of, of, of animals and organic forms in, in, in time. And then on top of that, they graphed uh, the evolution of machines. So if you, if you overlap this, these two graphics, you'll see that the, the machines tend to evolve quicker than, than animal forms. So, Having in mind that we haven't, uh, our planet hasn't seen a single life form that will last forever, all, all, all life forms are just here for a period of time, and that eventually we will extinguish ourselves. Perhaps uh, robots 
and machines will endure longer than us. So with that principle, if we manage to hear or listen or communicate with signals from life in another planet, they are thinking that they will not be organic life uh, signals, they will be machines. Because, we are, because today we are into machines, right? Mm. So again, it's, a, it's, a, it's another projection of even of, of, of our own future. If I can be a bit heretic, I think in, in a sense, like, I mean, this like, whole past and future thing, it doesn't really exist, you know? There's just the present, because then you're always in the future. So history is basically a reinterpretation of the past to the present, and the future is the interpretation of, you know, the present into something else. And these narratives are really interesting because they always move along the scope, you know? So, like, the life we're looking for is robotic because now we're obsessed with artificial intelligence and robots. And, and if you look at, like, sci-fi narratives, you know, the aliens in the 50s, the aliens were clearly the Russians. In Star Trek, the Klingons are clearly the Russians. The, what are the other ones called? The, um, the other ones. So the Germans as well, you know? And, <laughs> and so you always see, in these narratives, you always see, you know, they, like, they point right back at you. And, and it's, it seems to be very hard for us as a species to really transcend our... Thing. And in, ironically, maybe these actually spaceships we shoot into space are the most material transcendence. I think that's why I find like something like Voyager or these spaceships interesting because they are actually they kind of separated themselves from us, right? They're like quite literal. Hmm? The, <clears throat> just to close the topics because I think we have to keep uh, moving forward. The the I mean, like, what's interesting is uh, you know, as we keep thinking about horror back, we are like desperately looking for something out there. There is this like vast amount of space around us. Um, of course, somebody has bothered to make a visualization of the amount of trash, what's called space junk, um, that we have managed to in these desperate attempts to place outside of the planet. And there is, uh, I mean, like by now we are completely surrounded by remnants and like debris and just like things we have, um, uh, you know, just ourselves thrown out there. We are not particularly clean um, in, in this kind of like a horror backward thing. And thinking about um, intelligences and the, the, um, the things that we project, you know, like the, the quest that we have for um, these uh, narratives of the, you know, like colonization, what's out there, what's in the moon, who is there. Um, it's very funny because there is um, there is a, a pareidolia. I think almost everybody sees a rabbit in the moon. There is, of course, uh, uh, like one of the most well known. Uh, like there is an Aztec story, but one of the most well known of those is about Yutu, which is the rabbit that is in the moon that's making the elixir of immortality. And he belongs to a princess called Chang. And um, of course, this was the, the when China recently uh, launched a rover into the moon. Um, of course, the, the names of both um, devices was like Chang and then uh, U2, which was the little rover. Um, the, of course, the 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 rabbit rover did not make it. It uh, it had a very um, uh, complicated time and it uh, it failed. And what was very interesting for me in in this kind of uh, situation is that um, this uh, piece of equipment um, actually uh, and, and it's a little bit of a, it's a different kind of projection because it's not just like the colonizing projection where we will make like this like ranch and like Indians and cowboys uh, crude fantasies, you know, this was a little bit more elaborate than that. And so the <clears throat> it, this was like a little bit more related to Isaac Asimov's loss of robotic and so on. Um, because that uh, you to the Jade Rabbit, uh, as, as it was dying, uh, tweeted back to Earth um, the following. <clears throat> Although I should have gone to bed this morning, my masters discovered something abnormal with my mechanical control system. My masters are staying up all night, working for a solution. I heard their eyes are looking more like my red rabbit eyes by now. Nevertheless, I am aware that I might not survive this lunar night. Chang does not know about my problems yet. 
if I can't be fixed, everyone, please comfort her. Let's remember Chang is also a machine, yeah? Um, before the departure, I studied the history of mankind's lunar probes. About half of the past 130 explorations ended in success. The rest ended in failure. This is space exploration. The danger comes with its beauty. I am but a tiny dot in the vast picture of mankind's adventure in space. The sun has fallen, and the temperature is dropping so quickly. To tell you a secret, I don't feel that sad. I was just in my own adventure story, and like every hero, I encountered a small problem. Good night, Earth. Good night, humanity. And poof, it's right. <laughs> and I mean, like, which, uh, what's funny is like this is like very uh, tender and so on. And but it's, uh, I mean, I, I, I find I find it uh, fascinating that we still have the need to create this kind of gripping narrative devices. Um, the I don't find it so. No. No. No, that's... Ah, this is something that speaks to what Naum was uh, talking about before. It's a, it's a quote of something that he Do you, do you know the do you know the story of the moon landing and the letter, the alternative letter? So the American moon landing. So all, I mean, all these like efforts, they obviously have different outcomes, right? And then for every outcome, there's a narrative. And with the moon landing, there's actually a letter that was it Nixon who was then? No, it was Nixon, right? I mean, the, the president after Kennedy would have read in case they had failed, and it's very similar. You know, it's like my fellow Americans. I mean, like, they're not going to come back, but they yeah. did. <laughs> but very heroic. Very heroic, you know? And, and I think that like it's, there's, there's like a range of these things that can happen, and they're kind of like being catered in with these narratives. But actually, in a sense, I mean, like the, your story of the, being the body in space, I think actually really relates to the rabbit in space, right? Because it's kind of like a, it's an effort to humanize the inherently. And then the robot is like a doubly inhuman. It's a non-human thing in an, you know, deadly environment with the knowledge that maybe with the knowledge that maybe that's kind of you know this is it <laughs> you know so and i think like there's so many motivations and motivations to actually humanize something like that especially if it's a public effort and it's kind of like wrapped into like a national narrative that that's you know it's it's there's an irresistible there's an irresistibility of of narrative i would say you know and, and that kind of really comes to then a lot of art that kind of gets roped into these things plays plays into that unless the artists resist and say like well we actually want to think with you about what this means you know we don't want to like at the human level you know because the scientists I mean the scientists often are aware of how remote this is to what you know we do otherwise you know and they kind of like and it's also one of the fascinations that it's something that that you know like really points beyond us. Anyway, you're the rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, that that closes, I think, the topic of uh, horror vacui colonizing and so on. And that, then again, if there are questions, yeah. they can be now. Alguien tiene alguna pregunta, comentario? Sí. Spanish? No. Spanish is okay. What about Hebrew? Yeah. Okay. And we translate. Yeah. Oh, you have. Yeah, yeah. 
Eh, no es una pregunta, pero es un comentario que me parece que también enmarca un poco la producción de imágenes, ya que ustedes en realidad están hablando desde el marco artístico. El rover de, de Marte hace foco en una moneda de un penny de Estados Unidos para mandar sus imágenes. Y me parece que hablando de gentrificación y de space, real estate, que hay muchas compañías afuera, de hecho hay una gran competencia de space state, eh, es interesante traer también eh, lo que se está usando como imagen para enfocar la imagen que recibimos, eh, para traer un poco la conversación también a lo que, lo que nosotros hacemos, generar imágenes. ¿no? Yeah, it's true. I mean, there, I mean, it, and 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 there, there's a problem with a lot of this imagery. Uh, before we were talking about the Voyager, so it's you know like what kind of culture we're taking out there and what kind of ideas. With the Voyager, there, there was a, a another problem, but uh, it's I will relate it to it. In the Golden Record, there, there there is a man and a woman, and. Oh yeah, we're going to talk about it. There's an image. Mm. Hang on. So yeah. just, just. Uh, but I, I can trade on that a little bit as well. Like the, so the, the penny is not. A, it might be penny, but usually it's a quarter, right? A 25 cents. And there's a really. It kind of almost comes out of archaeology. So there's a really long history of, of imagery that would put, another thing. So you have an artifact basically that's kind of like, from somewhere. You know, it's like a bone. And then and then you would put like a quarter next to it basically to contextualize it. And in the And then the rover thing, for example, really interestingly relates to photography because they, they also have this color chart, which is actually a bit like your work. <laughs> and so you have these color charts and they took pictures and some of the first photos in space were essentially like somebody with this like selfie stick holding out um, this like color chart to calibrate the Kodak film against the not Earth environment because they really didn't know how the colors would turn out, you know? And there's, there's something really interesting if you think about like picture representation that they, they didn't even know what light looks like, right? Um, you know, I mean, like, and I think one of the, one of the just uh, to close it again, one of the things is that we used to be placing images into this space before, yeah? like, and these are the, I'm sorry, this is like, it's not advertising, it's just like the only image that I could find that has uh. this kind of thing. Um, and I made it for an advertising, it's a long story. But um, this is the kind of imagery that we used to place into the, into the uh, outer space. And what we are receiving now is, uh, come on, don't do this. Don't, I don't, you know, what the images that we receive now are like this. They are completely empty. Mm. So we are still trying to figure out how do we populate, you know, like now that we have to take away Uh, the gangs and the green men and, and all those things. How, what are we going to put in this kind of space? Mm. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, yeah, okay. I just have a very short comment, I think. Um, I, well, you just passed one of the things like colonization, gentrification, all of that stuff. And also the images that we, what did you say, like put into space. I, I like how your discussion is going about noticing certain paradigms or certain tendencies. What I would love to hear from you is what would you like to see instead? Like, for instance, if you see the nature, uh, like if, if you would see the dark vision, which <laughs> I think it's funny, uh, that the tendency to go into space is about gentrification, what would you like to see instead? Or like if you If you think that we produce a lot of garbage, what would you like to see instead? How should we go there? And especially that this is not a scientific place, but a creative place, I think the formula of 3% of talking what we don't like and 97% of talking what we like could be a more creative um, approach. Another comment about the robots or like machines and the, and the human life, I am curious though, isn't it that we are actually developing quite fast ourselves? It is still like uh, tentacles that we are creating these, uh, these technological things. Mm. I think our speed of cognition has um, very much developed. I think we are still living in somewhat old paradigms of thinking that 
let's look at the ancient man, how it was done, right? I, I don't believe that. I think that right now our ability to absorb and uh, correspond to situations is much faster than it used to be. And I, I wonder also about this fiction of time that you were saying. And uh, to add that there is actual expansion of a lifetime as well. Anyways, so that these are the two things. I think we might outlive machines. Mm. We might outlive machines. <laughs> I don't know. Or we live with them. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, but I, I think that, that like, in, in that I completely agree with you. Like, one of the things that I, where I feel compelled to bring up these darker notions is because I, like, a lot of times people tend to approach this uh, thing with a lot of um, optimism. And I don't think, you know, I, I actually don't think, that's like following into a kind of, uh, uh, very blindly into a certain thing. So, um, in, into a kind of, like, something that's also coming like straight up from the military so if you're if you're going to take it into a creative uh, place i think first we dust it off and we are like okay wow yeah there's like some pretty like uh, uh, dark things here i am someone that actually lives as, a, as, as an artist i do live from dark images so that's probably why i look at it like that so it's uh, i think like in terms of like placing it in within a creative construct the choice, for example, for me to put it in a dark place is because the kind of work I make is not joyful, happy work. I make mm. work that comes from a dark place, and it, it, you know, I make dark images, and I, that's, the, that's my deal as a, as in, in that sense. So that's why, um, yeah, yeah. That, you know, that's, that's why the, the position, but... Uh, Sorry, I'm just, I think I'm just abusing your brain. I'm like, yeah, but she knows the solution. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like if you say, oh, you know what? They are putting garbage into space. Of course, in the back of your mind, you're like, they should also send garbage bags. Yeah, you of know course, what I mean? Of course. I don't know, whatever. But I'm they sure do, they do. The thing is that they do. Yeah, like, they send it like gigantic nets. And, and, and they do try to clean up, and it's, I mean, it's messy. And of course, when you think about robots, you know, I don't spend too much time talking about robots, because if you ever look at the robot competitions, you, the robot competitions are the saddest thing on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. You look at these this very clunky things, and the competition is, like, let's see if, we can, if the robot can open the door. Yeah? And they just see like 10 robots from, it's like the Robot Olympics, 10 robots from 10 different countries trying to see if they can open the door. And it's like, you know, if that's where they are at, we can go for a few more thousand years before we are anywhere, you know, where we are anything comparable. In that, I completely agree with you. So I thought the, one more, the, the, the tentacle thing was really, tentacles always work, right? In every field, <laughs> bring up tentacles, it works. And, uh, um, oops, not really loud. The, um, but I think what's interesting about that, or like what I think what draws, so I, my, I'm also relatively dark about these things. And I think like what drew me into that initially was this kind of like realization or like a hunch that, that like what's interesting about these things are the narratives in a way that they're quite melancholic, right? Because like maybe in them they have something that this kind of like future in space that was a, as it was imagined is not going to happen like that, but maybe it's going to be a technological future that's actually this can right so it's kind of like an extension of human industry you know so like earth is kind of like going out and drawing in resources that, that might not be here in a technological way and then maybe even so that's why I said the tentacle works really well because you can cut it off and it does its own thing so these things might take on an agency of their self you know yeah. yeah just very quickly so we can move to the next one I mean what I would like to see uh, in in our space activities is to bring actually these discussions, these critical discussions in, 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 on the tables where people are making decisions, and that's what I have devoted my last 10 years. Um, trying, and, and these are intelligent people, really, and once you, you tell them, hey, why are you using colonization? Why 10% of your crew in outer space are only women? What about uh, racial, gender? Why we don't have gay astronauts openly, etc.? So. It, it's it's it, it's about that. Uh, that's what I want to see more discussions in 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 the public sphere. In the yeah, in space agencies and space industry. Okay, good. So now is the time for the fifth um, mm -hmm. subject: communication or language and being understood. 
And I think this also speaks about the kind of things that one is also putting out there. Yeah, like what, um, how are we, like, like I think it's like now we're getting at the point where there are attempts at communication and at leaving a mark in there. And um, here is where the, you know, where, where these things, I mean, like where what artists and scientists and like, uh, the, like these kinds of creative efforts have gone through at trying to establish links and, and see if there is any um, possibility. This is what you were talk trying to talk about before, Naum, so you go. Yeah, well, uh, again, uh, after the teaser, uh, this is the, the Golden Record. Uh, it was a very controversial project uh, that was led by Carl Sagan. This is uh, one, one, one image, uh, one side of the Golden Record, but there's another, another side where there's, again, talking about images, uh, there, there is a woman and a man standing, uh, because of course we are trying, to, with this golden record, we try to put, it's a curation of human culture, so we can, perhaps, uh, it, it could be read by, by aliens or alien intelligence, but uh, there are many controversies around this kind of information, and when, when, when you see the images of the man and the woman standing together, Guess what do you see? One of them is waving, one of them is saying, hi, we are humans. And who's that, the man or, or the woman? The man, the man. So it's like, all right, okay. Maybe it's a, also a way of communicating our macho societies and the way we, we, we function, sadly. Uh, but then why we're not talking about our wars in these things? Why we're not talking about inequality? and Why we're not talking about how much we don't care about our planet. Well, but they, they, we're, we're trying to be nice, but at the same time, we cannot uh, uh, uncover our nastiness uh, because it's natural, perhaps. So, yeah, that's the, the, the golden record. So, the, and, and, and there's, again, there are many controversies. Like, again, should we send this kind of information to the universe? Maybe uh, uh, some people are even afraid that uh, aliens will read this as a, oh, look at those primitive beings, let's, let's uh, kill them. The, the, the thing about the golden record one has to remember, this is from the, the vinyl record era. So this is recorded as a vinyl record. And every time I see this, this thing, I think of aliens with turntables and headphones scratching. Yeah, like, how are they going to read this thing? This is something that just makes me, you know, always makes me think how, how much we really think that whatever technology or whatever modality we are using for communication is completely universal. I mean, like now, I don't know, what are we going to send? Laser discs or like cassette tapes or, I mean, I don't know, like the cassette tape, you know, there's like the, the vinyl record for the aliens with the turntables and then for the teenager aliens, we send cassette tapes, yeah? Like something <laughs> like that. They would probably send a Spotify subscription. It's a, a Spotify, it's a playlist, <laughs> yeah. uh, iTunes playlist. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the record. I mean, the record is really interesting because it's this quest for, and I think that's a nice segue into the next one. It's a seg. It's a, the quest for a universal language, right? Mm -hmm. So what what does indexicality mean? And and you know, is it math? Like the scientists obviously say, like, well, it should be math. Maybe it should be math. You know, like if you have the record, then you presuppose that somebody can touch it and has eyes. That might not happen, you know, and then. So this quest of like like if you want to communicate with something and you know and and that even then it was regarded as a, a joke you know I mean it's beautiful and it also contains is it this one it contains the images as well because uh, one of them contains I encoded images as well and they're yeah. incredible I mean they're like mm -hmm. empty freeways people in supermarkets people eating and drinking licking ice cream it's amazing you know and it's a it's a snapshot of and then it's kind of global, there's also some people in the jungle, but, you know, it's, it's, very, it's like civilization talking to itself, basically, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, like, in, but in terms of communication, what's funny is that, of course, that, you know, that we are, like, trying to figure out what's the golden standard to send to the aliens, some snapshot of who we mm -hmm. are and whatnot. And then, in, this is like an anecdote again, um, in 1978, uh, the powers that be, let's say NASA, sent out the ISEE, which was a, a solar probe that went to deep space to try to figure something out. And 
um, it, it was not fully expected. You know, there was like the possibility that it could return, but then it didn't return on time, so maybe it doesn't return. It went into an extended orbit, but it finally came back. And as it's coming back, uh, they figure out, yes, okay, everything is working, all the signals are fine, it's transmitting back to Earth, great. What happened? Uh, we changed technology, so we are not able to read anything of what this machine is trying to tell us. Um, which is pretty fantastic, yeah? It's a little bit like when we think about this idea of trying to communicate with some larger, vast mode of intelligence. However, we, can, we are not even able to read ourselves because if you think about the Egyptian hieroglyphics, we don't know what they say. If you think about Mayan or Aztec uh, alphabets, we have no clue. Um, if you think about old English, try to read Shakespeare in the original and then come back to me and tell me if you know what it says. So like this idea that if we cannot read ourselves in a, in a hundred year period, how can we expect, you know, like this, this larger aims when we are not able to function outside our finitude. It's, it's, it's cute. Yeah, that's, that's, should we tell the story? Yeah. Okay, it's another story. Like um, when uh, one of the scientists that was involved in the golden record, uh, she had an idea of sending some brain waves. So it's like the, the, every time that we think our brain uh, irradiates frequencies, like a, a little uh, electromagnetic field. So, but actually she was falling in love in that moment with someone. And that was with the leader of the project, with Carl Sagan. So she was madly in love with, with him. But she had this idea of the brainwaves, and, and she told Carl Sagan, hey, sh we should put some brainwaves also, you know, like after the ice leaking mm. image. Uh, let's put that. And Carl Sagan said, yeah, why not? So she's there, they're recording with an electroencephalogram headset, uh, her brainwaves, and she's there sitting and thinking of Carl Sagan, her new love. And, and eventually, that's, those are the brainwaves of someone that went to space that is in love with Carl Sagan, the, 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 the leader of the project. <laughs> and, and again, this is, I mean, it's quite, all these little stories are quite amazing, not because of the true communication that it could happen with an alien uh, intelligent form, but it's about, it's so much about being human and how do we see ourselves and how we communicate with ourselves, with with all our nuances and, and problems, etc. So, uh, space and the future space is, is also the, it's about us. It's only about us, pretty much. Mm, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely a lot of like communication and miscommunication that we all, you know, there's really like the thread that like weaves through what we're talking about. There's another nice Voyager-related thing that the, they, they still talk to Voyager, the one with the... I mean, Voyager and Pioneer, they have these plays. And at Voyager, they have a... They're essentially in Pasadena, in California, where JPL is. They have a... They have a computer that pretends to be the old computer, right? Because Voyager is far away, and there's like a clock that shows how long it's like 40 years. Mm -hmm. And the So there's something on Earth that basically pretends it's the past to be able to talk to this thing that's in the space with this little kind of like magnetic tapes. So it took like a really conscious effort that they tried to replicate with the, the other thing that they couldn't pull off to actually like maintain this spatial, it's almost like a spatial temporal thing, right? Because like it's far away. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of sci-fi stories about that as well. So it makes me think of Stanislav Lem, mm -hmm. transfer when the astronauts come back and they were faster, like almost, they were faster than we travel, so time, you know, like Einsteinian time works differently, so they come back and it's the future and they cannot relate to humanity anymore. So I think, and, and Lem, I mean, amazing writer who like really addressed many of these problems. And it, it actually made me think of Solaris as well, which is probably his most famous book, which essentially speaks to like what would happen if we encounter something that we cannot understand. And it's interestingly also phrased through communication, right? So they go to this planet, they find this ocean, they know it's intelligent, and that's it. You know, there's a hundred in the book. There's a hundred years of scientific conferences that talk about nothing, right? And and so this idea, like, what would actually, and maybe in, and in a sense, this kind of like whole robot thing, that 
comes up now almost speaks to the same. What, what, you know, if we create something and we cannot talk to it anymore, right? So maybe that future is going to come about by our own doing, you know? So the robots come back and they're going to colonize us and we don't even know, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's all about these things, you know, like knowledge and communication and this like membrane that gets put up by space and time. I think it's, yeah. I think that it's time to the questions. If, uh, si, la, si alguno de ustedes tiene algún comentario o pregunta sobre la comunicación, el lenguaje, sobre estos subjects que han estado tratando. ¿No? <laughs> bueno, pues vamos a pasar al último punto, six point, no, six, that is responsibility, exomatters, extraplanetary juice. And, and this is a kind of a, a, like a point that like tries to think about like, like the idea of like trying to understand how how do like if we are really thinking about the space as only an extension of of what we are. I mean, like the the like in that in that sense, for example, I I don't fully agree. Like I, I see what Naum says in terms of like that it's only us. For me, it's not quite it because if I only would want to look at myself, I look at the mirror. Um, the you know like I'm I'm curious at. Uh, uh, something other that I that cannot define and I cannot see and I try to hint at and so on. And I'm also trying to think that it would be possible to, um, um, like if we were to be able at some point, not as myself, Julieta, but as like some kind of form of uh, humanity to leave um, uh, the planet, that it would be with some kind of learning having been done. And, you know, like with some kind of like not repeating the same um, things. So how, yeah, I don't know, like a, a, a big question for me is to think, well, I mean, like how, how are we going to negotiate um, like this vast outdoors? The, is there, um, and, and like this goes, of course, to the points of um, resource extraction. There are of businesses trying to do this uh, hypothetical uh, asteroid mining things. Who owns what? Uh, what kind of legislation? what belongs, um, and so on. So before um, getting into this, I pass it on to the, uh, Naum and um, Sasha. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know terribly much about the jurisdiction. I would like to know more, actually. But I mean, I know that it came out, like a lot of it came out of the Cold War, right? And a lot of it came out of this idea that, that like, the moon, like the moon landing you know, the whole story, I guess, or like the strategic thing behind the moon landing or like the moon base is that you want to have somebody who's not on Earth who can press a button to retaliate, right? So if, you know, the Soviet Union and the US are at war, then there's somebody you cannot reach and you can press the last, last, last button, you know, so to, and, and I think, and then to kind of like defuse that situation, there was like a certain, you know, idea to kind of like demilitarize space, and it really goes back to that. I don't. It was not done out of out of the goodness of of humanity, like in very literally, but but I, it has created a really interesting situation. It's like torn between the public and the private now, right? Because the public is like, this, we don't use it, and the private is like, well, we can. We are the ones who can make it usable because we are going to go for the resources. And and then the question is like, you know, what's the kind of socioeconomic context of that, because it makes a lot of sense, right? And, and um, I don't know, and there's always, I mean, back to the, um, what my historian friend said the other day, so like often there's, there's certain dreams of abundance that get roped into that as well. So if we go to space, we come back with all the riches, which is totally colonial imaginary, obviously, and, and also an end of conflict, you know? So there's this, this idea that like we only fight over resources so if there's limitless resources, we wouldn't fight anymore, which is obviously debatable, you know. But it's just very interesting how like the motivations for these things work, arguably. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, then we have the, <laughs> the adapter. <laughs> and, uh, when, uh, I'll pass it to you in a second, just because that's the next image. The, we were together in, in Moscow at the Cosmonautics Museum. And when one is thinking about like how do we legislate and like, the kind of like things that go, the nuts and bolts of how are we dealing with um, uh, you know, going into these territories and so on. This is the most fantastic piece of equipment ever invented, in my opinion. 
that, uh, that thing. You see it has holes on both, uh, a hole on both sides. And the name of it is <clears throat> the androgynous peripheral docking assembly. And that means that when, when, two, pieces, when two capsules are uh, assembling docking. in a space, are docking, um, it's a little bit like connecting, plugging something into a wall, right? Like something has prongs and something has holes. And then uh, the nations involved were like, I don't want to be the woman. I don't want to. So they had to make, yeah, they had to make a device that actually has hole, a hole on both sides so, they, so that they both could have penises, basically, I'm sorry, and, you know, and happily retain their manhood in space. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is one of the most, it's, I find this like one of the most conflict solving pieces of equipment yeah. ever invented. Ever. Yeah, that uh, was, in terms of legislation, yeah, like that's. Uh, yeah, and that was the first time that the, the Russians and the Americans had to work together to put <laughs> their two spaceships in one, like the docking. And in, in that meeting, uh, they were like, okay, so you're going to be the female part and we're going to be the male. And the other, the other ones would be, no, you are, I'm going to be the male and you're the female. So they left the, the meeting with no agreement. And, and then engineers trying to solve, okay, and let's go androgynous. Yeah, but, but well, um, and so yeah, it, it, it shows a lot of who, of, of, of these like power games. Uh, and, and when it comes to, to, to the space treaty, I mean, we, we, there's something uh, in the 70s that was written by international law and the United Nations and the Committee for the Outer Peaceful Uses of Space uh, that is called Space Treaty, which basically says things about ownership, exploitation, no nations or their individuals should exploit our space. Um, uh, or, or celestial body resources. However, a couple, like three years ago, uh, in the U United States, they approved a law uh, for private companies to exploit uh, natural resources uh, contradicting international law, and, and that's okay. But on the other hand, there's another story, and that is also in, I think, I might be wrong, but somewhere in, in, in mid-70s, uh, a group of countries in, in, in Central America, uh, uh, around the equator, actually, uh, they signed something called the Bogota Declaration. And they were saying that uh, if all the countries were actually violating their aerospace uh, territory, because the equator is, 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 is one of the best orbits, because it, you actually go all around the world. So they didn't want to have all the satellites of all the countries like passing in their skies and like getting some good photos. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they wrote that declaration and they tried to, to avoid using their airspace for military activities, for surveillance, for communications as well. And of course, for space policy makers, it was like a joke and no one listened to them. So, I mean, this example of how on one hand, one country is allowed to override space, space law somehow, and, and on the other hand, how a group of uh, uh, countries that are not that powerful, no one listens to them. So again, the, it's, it's very interesting to analyze the power structures in, in space. Ah, this was, I mean, this is supposed to be something about uh, mining and like this idea of like uh, resources because like, w like what Naum was saying, like, what's interesting is that the space is supposed to be like Antarctica. It belongs to nobody and it belongs to everybody. And of course what happens is that the space becomes like Antarctica, a place that can be mined by, by Canadian uh, oil extraction companies and, and so on. So right now, of course, it's just pure imagination. Now you're going to send this giant space. I mean, I would want to think that nobody owns it and it's an uh, uh, even field and it, it remains this like open space for um, Stanislav Lem and Isaac Asimov to place these images that can you know, take us further. I don't want to think that it is um, 
just an extension of my air rights because that's very pre-Galilean, you know, it's like thinking everything revolves around my planet and there's nothing else and the sun goes around it and if I keep shooting all the way then I also own the sun or something along those lines, which is pretty boring, I think. Um, the, um, I, mean, and, I mean, because what happens, of course, this is the, when we think the, the original space race was all built upon nationalism and it was basically an affair between the US and Russia, the, um, the, the Cold War and so on, now it's purely an economical thing um, that comes also from the limits to growth and the idea of uh, the planet becoming uh, very depleted in terms of resources, so there are these um, uh, beautiful diagrams about the space economies. Um, you know, what people want to find on asteroids uh, is, at this moment, is rare, mi it's not even gold or diamonds, what they want to find is rare minerals, which is the uh, coltan, and things like coltan, which is what makes your cell phone work. And uh, when you think, of, I mean, like, I don't know how they imagine this mining thing. What I know is the way that Colton is mined right now, the way our cell phones work now, is like this. That's how our cell phones are made to work. And um, I find a very, 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 very hard, you know, to go from this to this. It's, it's, uh, it's not so easy to jump, um, it's, it, and it's for the same purpose. And it, it really... It's, it's hard, you know, like that book, that uh, this science fiction novel in particular, it's, uh, I haven't written it, I'm not going to write it, but it's ugly. And so, of course, you know, that's, uh, um, that's, uh, the, the, uh, and, and again, you know, like this is, space trash, okay. well, this is, this is, this, I mean, like we were like looking at an image of a space trash before, yeah, like, uh, and that, that's just a projection, that's a visualization, that's how we think it looks, of course it doesn't look like that, we have no idea what it looks like. But uh, what the space junk, what this like asteroid mines, this Colton deposits in the asteroid, what they look like, this is in Ghana, and that's what it looks like, you know, that's... Uh, and again, I'm like the person that brings the dark uh, things to the table, sorry. That's... I mean, eventually, okay, I mean, eventually it has to do with like our imagery of nature, right? Or like our imagination of nature, and I think that's a really key point, which goes, like, there was a slide briefly of these parks, right? Uh, and and right. oops, no, no. Um, what did I do? Just imagine Mars. No, uh, what did I do? The, there was this like map of the moon with these little kind of like you know zones and 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 in a way that also relates to like the idea of like the American National Park, right? So it's like nature for the enjoyment of people, you know. But then the, then you know, do we think about when we think about space? Or what, if, when we think about nature, do we think about space yeah. or do we think about a forest? Yeah. Right. Like and and this idea that. Um, you know, like if, if you talk to a scientist, clearly nature, is, space is nature as well, you know, and so what's our relationship to nature, which kind of links back to the way that nature was depicted in art. I mean, nature, the history of art and the depiction of nature are inseparable, basically, right? And this kind of idea that like, and also like, you know, like what's our relationship with this thing? Whoa. <laughs> the space, space weather. <laughs> space gods. <laughs> Space, space is not happy with us. Moment, uh, yes. There might have been a space particle. No one is electrocuted. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean... Yeah, but... Yes, yeah, it works. Yeah. Do you want to take it from me? Maybe okay. not. Okay, okay let, let's chill and I'll tell your story. Uh, no, well, there was an image that I wanted to actually explain. I, you, you, you remember... Um, Basically, on, on, on the image that, uh, that, that killed the projector. Yeah, before yeah, the image that killed the projector. <laughs> the projector is over. We are almost um, almost finished. <laughs> we'll wait. Esperamos. Yeah. Yeah. No, this was like a map. It, it was a map of Mars with some uh, like parts uh, circled. Mm. So this, th 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 those parts are what they called planetary parks, uh, which means that uh, they are thinking, okay, if we go to another planet like Mars, that's the big uh, next step, uh, we should preserve some areas of it. So we keep them like intact from human intervention. And, and this is already assuming that we're going to uh, 
change it a little bit? I mean, uh, either terraformation or sending more, 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 more junk or, or, or exploiting it, but then it's like, okay, no, let's preserve some natural areas. And it's again, putting a template of what we're doing uh, uh, here, there, and, and, and I, th I think our vision should be, should be better than that. You know, sounds, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it already looks uh, apocalyptic to me. It sounds like I, gentrification, I, like I, Christine no, I, I, I want to imagine that there's going to, it's going to be like, a, uh, that there's going to be monuments, yeah? But it's, uh, that there's going to be like a monument to the, uh, but we will not know that these are monuments, yeah? Because they will be done by people other, or by others, others to us. So there can be this, uh, mm. um, this, large boulder that is actually a monument to some hero from i don't know what did this hero do it uh, ended the great famine in mars in the <laughs> yeah. uh, year 3700 but what's interesting about that like if you look at the moon i mean like these zones or like like what's protected there is actually the robots so mm. the rabbit is actually the monument which means that the rabbit fuses with the natural landscape, you know, mm. so it becomes part of the moon. But at at what know? moment are we not part of nature? Yeah, exactly. At, you know, at yeah. what moment uh, we decided to take ourselves and say, okay, we will not touch nature. It's like last time mm. I looked at myself, at least I was pretty natural. Yeah. 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 So, and, I mean, that's the discussion, but I think that's like really key to these things, like what, you know, like are we actually, is, I mean, the robots that we are producing are, in a sense, natural because they're product of a natural species, right? But then, or maybe, is this something that we kind of like need to distance? And, and this, that's why I was trying to make the connection with art yeah. earlier, because uh, I think that's really something that's been really one of the drivers of art, right? To kind of like negotiate our relationship with these things. Um. Um, <laughs> I, I think I just had like this like not so subtle. Uh. <laughs> so we have time now to open also the discussion to the public. Si alguien quiere hacer algún comentario de este sexto y último, porque ya van a dar a uh, ocho y veintidós, nos quedan cinco minutos, seis minutos para algún tipo de comentario. Uh, if you don't mind, we can talk about, or the people can ask about this last matter, like, or other or kind of, yeah. o, otro tipo de preguntas o cuestiones alrededor de, de esa entretenida, la verdad, muy entretenida, um, uh, diálogo entre vosotros tres, porque creo que, que ha sido mucho más interesante, ¿no? La manera en la que, más que un, uh, individualmente penséis una, se piense un speech, sino hacerlo de manera colectiva o de una manera mucho más entrelazada. ¿no? ¿Hay alguna pregunta? Sí, has a... I don't know. No, I'll, I'll do it in English. I don't know if um, I'll make sense of what I want to say, um, but I sort of heard all of you talking about this idea of art right now being part of the paradigm that it's part of. I mean, capitalism and all of the things that you can't shake off. And also I heard you, Julieta, talk about escapism and how you would like to sort of move away from this. I don't know if you have, and this is more of a challenge, I don't know if you have an idea of bringing art into this new world? And how do you how do you imagine this without technology? Because I think you're kind of tied to that. Um, I, I mean, like, personal. I don't imagine these things either. You know, it's like I don't want to think about it like as as, as uh, with or without technology. Like I think the set of the toolbox that I have is the toolbox of my time, and some of it comes with technology, and some of it comes without. And I mean, like right now, at least in terms of the process that I've been having for the past few years, I've been sort of like delineating um, things that are like, on the one hand, yes, I, I am, I, you know, I like these machines and I like these things, and I also see a dark side, and then just to keep finding a path and be like, okay, so where do I place my work next? So what has been up until now is a lot of um, using the work as a mapping 
uh, thing, you know, what I see, it ends up, um, maybe it's not about creating an object that is a solution, because I also don't think that objects do that, but um, at least with the kind of work that I make, is I make work that points the limits of, of, uh, of a problem, yeah? And I mean, like that's, I think, if, if that answers your question, in a way, yeah. Yeah, uh, in my case, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say es es escape from that. Uh, actually, uh, instead of, um, of, of, I mean, I, I think that uh, what space agencies are doing is, is extremely important, so much that we should, uh, they shouldn't be doing it on their own or alone. So they, we, we need to, to open up the, the conversation with other actors and uh, and, and, and well, now it's happening very clearly with private uh, sector. Uh, but now, uh, I mean, it's something re really recent. They're talking about space 4.0, which is uh, en about engagement with the public. I mean, they do this also because of securing national funding and etc. But but uh, talking about artists, it's still not easy to 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 get in. Sometimes they, I mean, private space companies, they are like doing uh, uh, fashion, uh, fashion shoots with, with models and, and, and spectacular things. But, but again, if, if artists were involved and if we were having an, an exchange of ideas, then I, I'm, I'm optimistic about, about inserting ourselves and not escaping. Yeah, uh, we're, one of the advantages of, of being an artist is that we're not in the payroll of space agencies or or, or government, so we can actually, in, in my experience, we can say things as they are, and, and some clever people in these places, they appreciate that, that someone is saying it. So I think, again, in my, in, in, from my point of view, and my, the, my way of working is acting inside these institutions and trying to shake them up a little bit. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, I'm not trying to get away from technology. I'm more like looking at how technology is not trying, not getting away from us. <laughs> but, um, but I would actually agree with the very last thing you said from my experience with um, engaging or watching people engage with biology. You know, that is actually, it's a really interesting thing to be embedded in this world and actually like see where the like thought lines and the narratives are. Because in the end, you know, like a realistic view of these things, how they like sit within a larger system of the economy and the natural world and the human world and whatever, um, is going to lead to more profound outcomes, right? But I mean, they do get overtaken by economic things quite easily and quickly, or I mean, national things or whatever. So, and that's, I mean, and that's something, but it's, it's quite hard to do. I mean, it's quite hard to actually like, you have to be very forceful to kind of engage with that on a level that really makes a difference. But some people have made that, you know, in a quite amazing ways from the art and design perspective. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess one, one way to put it is also the, the, that, of course, you know, there's something that happens when, in, in this kind of territories is that um, humanities and culture play a very, very small role. So uh, I think part of the, you know, part of like the, of the position that we occupy in, in our overlapping and yet distinct uh, ways is to to create the you know the territory the, the space that we can occupy as a larger uh, a body of cultural producers artists and whatnot to to move within this uh, territory and, and make things and actually own a piece of it and not just uh, be you know spectators and not just have it play for the interest of mining companies, but it, you know, there are other things to be done with it. That's one we have another question. Yes, uh, I would try to do in English. Uh, what do you think about cyborgs, biohacking, and bioart, and how the technology uh, converge with human? And, and that? I'm the cyborg person, though. <laughs> You're the cyborg person. You look a little bit. I don't know. I mean, I look like a cyborg. After no. the party last night. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that was the fun party. <laughs> but I, I think the cyborg image that like Donna Haraway, for example, puts up is a really, really useful one because it kind of speaks to the, you know, it speaks to this idea that like 
we are this hybrid, you know, and we've we have been this hybrid for like a hundred thousand years. And then there's a really this very, very interesting research about how the tools we make actually make us as well, you know, how the invent invention of kind of like making stone tools might have laid the foundation for language, you know. So because it's, if you put somebody into an MRI scanner and see them kind of like have them do the tools, they actually activate brain regions that you also use when you talk about them, you know. So there's a so we are this we you cannot as a human as a species you cannot separate us from these things. So this is almost like a non thing, the cyborg. The question is actually like how extreme do we want to put it and or do we want to cut off the tentacle at some point and say, which is probably happening now, you know, you see the first signs of these things kind of like start starting to think for themselves. And that's actually interesting because then you get like the, you know, then something new starts and, and you have to negotiate like a relationship with that. But I mean, that's my... Yeah, but I always think that we are like, we keep thinking about like the, the like the, the singularity and the artificial, in, I'm sorry, yeah. just, <laughs> the, this artificial intelligence thing because it's like a, uh, it's like a, a, a prox, it's like babies, yeah? Like we just like think in terms of reproduction. So it's like when we think about artificial intelligences and, you know, like, and then the machines will talk to us, it's like, oh, and then we will have babies with the machine or something like that. Um, the, the, uh, but, but I find interesting something that, that you were asking um, is um, that, of course, the more complex research gets, the more and more we turn towards biology because things are rhizomatic, because everything is related to things. It's a little bit like with medicine, you know, you don't, you realize that things are connected. If you chop somebody's arm, then maybe, you know, like, uh, or if your kidney hurts, then it means you have a brain tumor, like something along those lines, yeah, like, um, poor explanation, but things are rhizomatic, they are not um, like specialized, localized bodies of knowledge. This happens with, this is happening not only, I mean, like with, with architecture, with design, with almost everything, there is a biological turn, so um, it's... It's, it's muy interesante, it's really interesting. Uh, could you understand yeah, in Spanish? Yeah. Uh, es muy interesante justamente lo que has dicho, porque ayer, eh, eh, Zaer Apolo justamente llegaba al mismo lugar decía que en la medida en la que se piensan más las herramientas más tecnológicas para la arquitectura, justamente tiene que ver con los estudios que tienen que ver con lo biológico, con la biosfera. Es decir, de la manera en la que necesitas más la investigación y la ciencia en relación a esa nueva arquitectura que tiene que preservar, más son herramientas que se dan justamente para la preservación de un aire más limpio, de los sistemas de ventilación, de tal, en, ese, en esa idea entre cuanto más uh, tecnología desarrolla futuro, más primitivo parece que vuelves a los elementos, ¿no? Entonces es una relación también a la, a la que tú estabas llegando. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you take that into our space, uh, there's another debate in, in that field, which is humans in our space where it's difficult to be a human out there because we evolved here and, and the conditions that you find just in low earth orbit or on the moon or Mars are horrendous. We are not uh, designed for, for being in those environments. So uh, actually an astronaut spacesuit uh, space is, uh, is a spaceship in itself. It's not something that you put on, it's something that you have to go in. Um, and, and, and so it's like, okay, if that, is, is that really our future? And, and, and the discussion is, okay, how much we have to enhance or transform a human, a human body in order to endure extreme conditions in, in our space. So they're looking at, at a lot of space medicine. And, and high performance athletes, and what are the limits of modifying, of creating these mm. space humans? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's an ethical question. That, that makes me think of the membrane again, you know, because yeah. it's about like internalization and externalization. So, like, the, the, you know, the artificial intelligence in a way is like an externalization of, of cognitive things, you know, which kind of makes it really powerful because suddenly things can learn, which is something that only higher animals can do. But then the internalization would be the, to move into space and change your body with the environment, right? You would internalize the environment and maybe like evolve a certain way. And I think that's kind of, it's always in this like inside outside narrative somehow. We just have the, our oh, yeah. last question because he's more than Ah, no, it's fine. Then it's just a very short comment. With the space humans, I think 
is going to be similar to the airplane travel. Remember how the first people who were traveling airplane, they would vomit all the time. And, I th and now it's really just a mind thing. Yeah. Uh, right now it's much more normal and it's, it's not such, such a shock to the system. And I think in maybe 100 or 50 or maybe 20 years, flying to the moon is going to be much more acceptable mentally. Uh, and second, I just quickly throw it into to your previous point, Giliatis. Uh, there is this very good quote by Gabriel Tard. Uh, you know that everything is society, star cells, bodies, political groups, and the lively firing of the brain. And uh, I think that that's what I like so much about your panel, because you were bringing all of these elements into kind of the bigger picture. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, um mis últimas palabras también tienen que ver justamente con esto. ¿no? Creo que lo interesante del panel y de estos días es que hemos asistido a una idea presente del futuro, de esa idea del presente continuo, desde algo muy local, muy político, como pueden ser reacciones de índole desde el mundo del arte a una situación como Solange hablaba del Brasil, pero también el mundo de las ideas y de la filosofía, incluso eh, hackeando las ideas de varios pensadores que durante los 10 o 15 últimos años han intentado eh, y están intentando ¿no? dar esas alternativas a una conciencia de futuro desde diferentes ámbitos. Lo interesante es que de ahí eh, pasamos a las relaciones humanas, a otras alternativas, pero dentro de un sistema Uh, planetario, o sea, perdón, un sistema completamente terrestre de relación política actual para pasar justamente a esa especie de membrana que es la arquitectura o pensar ese otro espacio que no es un espacio afuera y con la vuestra creo que ha sido llevar todas las temáticas que se han tratado, aspectos políticos, económicos, feminismo, consumo ecológico, transnacional, colonización, es decir, si estamos en una era postcolonia, ¿no? estamos siempre, y más desde América Latina, ¿no? siempre tratando la idea de, de postcolonial studies, eh, la idea de qué manera todos estos ítems que han marcado también parte de la historia de nuestra humanidad en la Tierra también, eh, como digo yo, y perdón por la expresión, no cagarla cuando nos referimos y nos vemos desde otro espacio. Creo que el panel ha, ha, ha servido justamente para salir, en cierta manera, y al contrario, para dar una conciencia una más fuerte de que existe este futuro para nosotros, pero como una especie de reflejo también. Es decir, yo creo que es, sirve para de vez en cuando tener una autoconciencia, porque muchas veces nos enmarcamos en nuestra sociedad en este presente actual desde lo político, lo económico, etc. Y creo que la visión, eh, en cierta manera, de, de un... Uh, eh, ¿Cómo se llama? No microscopio, al telescopio. contrario, telescopio, da una imagen tanto de la microbolica, pero también de una especie ampliada para poder visualizar muchas veces y tener una distancia de cómo proyectarnos de una manera y que nos sirva no solamente a ese futuro inmediato o incierto, sino al contrario, para entender cuestiones del presente, como habéis estado trayendo. Mm. Hasta aquí, eh, muchísimas gracias, Julieta, Naum, Sasha. Creo que es una mesa que se puede continuar y podemos seguir invitando a gente. Creo que es eh, el comienzo de, ¿no? de toda una serie de panels y de cosas que esperemos tanto Julieta como vosotros sigáis desarrollando. Y también espero que haya sido interesante también para toda la gente que se ha quedado hasta el final. Son casi dos horas, eh, nos falta media hora para poder ver, no el espacio de fuera, sino el, el, el nuestro afuera, que es la Feria de Arte. No sé si tenemos ganas, pero bueno, de verdad, muchísimas gracias. Y muchísimas gracias a Arteba, como no, a todo el equipo que habéis estado, a las traductoras. Por favor, un aplauso y un aplauso también a los tres invitados y a todos ustedes. Gracias.